it is central not only to the robustness of knowledge in general, but in science, that we actually don't go too quickly to consensus. <laughs> and that we make sure we explore the implications of divergent ways of framing an issue. So for that, in that spirit, <laughs> I'm going to just make explicit a, um, a theme I want to really elaborate on in my little talk, which picks up from Ian's excellent talk at the beginning. And this point that uh, you made very clearly a number of times, Ian, that uh, there's nothing really fundamentally different about social research compared to environmental or ecological or indeed biological complex systems research in general. And for the purpose of just a discussion, I would say, yes, there is. And the reason for that, and I'll try and be accountable for it, is that policy making, evidence gathering, science itself are social phenomena. They're not biological or environmental or ecological. They're social phenomena. And so uniquely in social science, it's completely unique that the social phenomena are at both ends of the research telescope. We're looking at them, but the process of looking is itself a social phenomenon. And from that, there flows a huge amount of implications that I think are insufficiently discussed because they're inconvenient. They disrupt processes of legitimation and the construction of robustness. And one of them hinges on this topic of qualitative research, although it's not the same issue, actually which is the simple question, which I think Ian came to very nicely in, in your talk, Ian, at the end. The, the dichotomy itself, I, I'm saying this, is an obstructive, obstructive one. The idea that there is a distinction between qualitative and quantitative of a fundamental kind, that quantification, quantitative data is more fundamental, that they're on a spectrum, that indeed quantitative research is somehow more desirable, are based on a dichotomy that's fundamentally flawed. Because quantitative research itself is also qualitative. The sense that it's not comes from structures of privilege in policy making, whereby we afford privileges to quantification as a cultural feature. But actually, it is impossible to quantify without categories. And the question is, where do the categories come from? The categories are qualitative. There is no quantification that is not fundamentally qualitative in that sense. And qualitative research is more explicit about that and offers a number of ways of trying to explore different types of categories, different kinds of questions, in the way Ian ended up very nicely alluding to in answer to the question about prior to data, you have social processes. So I want to unpick some of those issues uh, in the talk I give, which is that no, uh, what I've just said, I know no one knows this more than those at the hard end doing the really difficult and demanding task of policy making. And in that task, what is really necessary is to remind very entrenched political, economic and cultural interests of the imperatives and the implications bearing on policies, the inconvenient ones. You need every help you can get in that business. It's very difficult to remind. This is a kind of diagram that appears often in ecosystem services and other such uh, uh, activities that we've got centre stage here, that you have physical nature impinging on ecologi ecological environments, impinging on societies and economies. We're not set free from the world. We're actually contained within it. And our policies and institutions are contained within that. So it's a very difficult task to remind <laughs> decision makers and entrenched interests of all sides about this. And so one needs very strong resources, evidence-based policy, sound science, the gold standard of the randomized control trial. And quantification enjoys a greater privilege. And we should be very careful about undermining it. People like me should be very careful about that. Because it is, in fact, serving very important political functions, which I, for one, would support. But the point is, it's a cultural, point. It's a cultural fact that relevance and impacts, the gold standard, is quantification. But I just want to unpick what that really means in practice. It has that effect. And so if we see, we've heard risk assessment alluded to, we've heard ecosystem services alluded to, I'm going to make a point now that I believe applies in general to quantification in policy making right across the board, life cycle assessment, cost benefit analysis, uh, all kinds of assessments. So please challenge me if you think I'm wrong in that very general claim. And the point is this. But when sound science or evidence-based policy that's based on reduced, aggregated, quantified data is used to inform policy making, you get a picture like this. You have a horizontal axis with a metric. You have either you're asking a question about a single option 
uh, is it acceptable or tolerable or not, or you're comparing it to another policy option and trying to determine what the degree of difference is between and which is more favourable. And a typical policy analysis will show a picture like this. It's actually very rare that policy appraisals look across a very wide range of policies and compare them, or in this case, technologies. But the picture is like this, that somehow neat, robust quantification give, and aggregation gives this kind of picture. The problem is that it is rather rare to step back from that picture and do a meta-analysis without aggregating <laughs> and show in a peer-reviewed, policy-relevant literature, this shows arguably the most mature and sophisticated field for the use of quantification in informing policies, matured over decades in the, in the field of comparative risk assessment of energy options, all studies peer-reviewed and conducted only by government agencies and then peer-reviewed, co conducted for government agencies. The number of studies is on the right-hand side. You see enormous latitude. And I believe this, in, in answer to a simple question, what are the risks of nuclear, for instance, here? And I believe the same picture can be drawn from toxicological data, from life cycle assessments, from ecosystem service valuation. If you, don't, if you take your attention back from a single committee or a single report, aggregating its findings, and look across a range, you find a picture like this. And if you do so for a range of different alternative policy options or interventions or instruments or technologies, you find a picture like this. Enormous overlap. It is typically possible to justify from the peer-reviewed literature in a given policy area any choice one wants within the bounds of rigour, disciplinary rigour in that field. So the point isn't to throw the baby out with the bathwater, it's not to reject quantification, it's to say quantification does not do what it says on the tin. <laughs> It, will, it can be aggregated and appear to give a deterministic, single prescriptive answer, but in, it typically doesn't do so with any greater robustness and other answers could equally be derived. It's serving a political function to justify decisions. And the reason for this is that behind those pictures lie a multitude of framing assumptions. Where the categories come from, where the questions come from, what we mean by this, that or the other factor that's actually included and essential to analysis and determines the outcomes. And of course, qualitative research is equally prone to this. It's just that, as we've seen in the debate so far, everyone knows that about qualitative research. It is more challengeable. Quantitative research is presented with a cultural body language, especially when it's aggregated, as if it's not so challengeable. And that, therein lies the power politically, but also the hazard. And so I just want to take another sort of shot at this. The world is a complicated place. It's not anything goes. There's hard realities out there which we must respect, but typically, and some things are just plain wrong, but typically in, in intercoupled environmental, physical and uh, human systems, there are, we, our knowledge is underdetermining of what the reality actually is. So there's a range of different ways of defining the focus, the question, the scope of appraisal, the, the networks of causes and effects that we highlight can all be subject to different, equally valid, equally legitimate, equally robust views. And where we do this, we see that the picture, you see in the chart here, the little charts on the left there are drawn from, an, uh, Roland alluded to multi-criteria mapping. Uh, those bars are, are like a chart I just showed you, showing the ordering of a, a, a consistent series of six policy options on GM as it happens. But the point here is these studies came from in-depth interviews with members of government advisory panels on GM in the UK a few years ago asking them to rate different policies according to their favourability. And although the committees that these guys sat on came up with single determinate answers, the individual experts, when interrogated, which is very rare, came up with radically different pictures. Because even they, in this very specialist community, adopted very different framing assumptions of what counts as harm, what counts as benefit, what counts as, as, as baselines, etc., etc. So the point is, the body language suggests otherwise, but it is always the case that qualitative assumptions and framing uh, conventions lie behind the quantification. So my point then is that the picture given by science is partly shaped and reproduced by the institutional setting. So there you see knowledge, science in the middle. It's of course true of all other knowledge. This isn't, science actually does a better job than most forms of knowledge of being rigorous in the face of this, but only where it acknowledges how it gives different answers depending on different questions. 
So the point is, in these diagrams that we see quite often, that knowledge is in the middle, it's conditioned by the institutions and the cultures, but it's also around the outside because it is the only way in which we know about nature. We don't engage with nature directly, we do throw through our knowledge. So the point then is, both quantitative and qualitative research are equally conditioned by framings. But the dimensions and the topologies of different framings, which yield different pictures of, of answers, are inherently qualitative. So there isn't really a dichotomy between the two. They are both constituting each other. All quantification, for these reasons, is intrinsically qualitative as well. And so the key distinction I think we should be looking at is not between quantitative and qualitative, but the necessity in either tradition of work to be careful about these singular prescriptive answers, whether biased or not, or advocacy or not, is not the issue. It's, in fact, they're most dangerous when they're dressed up as being objective. If you say, this is the answer to policymakers, as if there's only one reasonable answer from a given question, typically it's very hazardous. It's what the policymakers often want, especially if they've told you what answer to give them. But it is not a good representation, in my opinion, of the realities. Whether quantitative or qualitative, what is a good representation of realities are what I call, it's been mentioned, plural and conditional pictures, showing how the picture one gets of the biological system, the environmental system, the social system, varies depending on the assumptions you take. And that's, a quali that, that's qualitative in the sense that it's looking at different framings, but it's equally true of qualitative and quantitative research. So to finish up the talk then, I wanted to, again predictably, just say something a bit more pragmatic, because that may come over as a bit philosophical, even though I hope I've, tr I hope I've substantiated that it's a very practical issue. But there are very practical things can be done about this dilemma. And I'll, I'll show that by just this picture looking at risk, risk assessment, the, the kind of doyon, the gold standard, as several policy documents refer to it as being, of quantification, whereby Risk is the, the, where we, all the tension goes, but implied in the concept of risk, there are different states of knowledge. There is uncertainty, which we've heard about very nicely in the, in the, in the first talk from Ian, um, where by definition, we cannot be confident in the assigning of probabilities and therefore unable to aggregate in a way that gives us a single answer. But also on the other side of this diagram, there's ambiguity. There's where, not about how likely things are, but how confident we are in the categories. The notions of benefit or harm, um, the distributional issues, how fair something is, the choice of alternatives to look at in the first place and how to define them, whose values and ideas of society come to the fore. And then down in the bottom right-hand corner, this picture yields uh, recognition for ignorance, where we don't know what we don't know. It's very difficult to get policymaking to acknowledge this state. But it's the dominant one, uncomfortably, when you look at uh, experience of issues like BSE, endocrine disruption, ozone depletion. These were not things that were actually fairly well characterised, but in the end we got the probabilities a bit wrong. They were surprises out of left field. And there's good surprises happen too. So the point I want to make in this chart is twofold. One, the reason we give all our attention to quantification and, and actually aggregated quantification are political. We're pushed there by institutions liability law, political procedures, institutional remits, environmental agencies have a job to do, they have a particular procedure to follow, that yields particular kinds of pictures, committees have to come to a conclusion because the minister won't be very pleased if you say on the one hand, on the other hand. It's a political factor that moves us to that top left. Insurance policies, models where you're supposed to reduce and aggregate rather than explore the envelope. So it's not because people are bad or silly that they constantly end up quantifying and getting out single numbers for things that plainly don't have single number answers. It's because we're pushed there by political pressures. And so my point is, using both quantitative and qualitative methods, not fixating on the difference between them, because they are at their most powerful when they interact with one another, we can get out of this straitjacket. We can look at uncertainty in ways that don't pretend it can be quantified, which by definition it cannot. If you're quantifying, it's risk. But you can talk about the envelopes and you can talk about the uh, sensitivities. Then looking at different scenarios, different perspectives, using techniques like multi-criteria mapping I showed at the beginning, but there's a host of such methods. So being systematic about how different framings of a problem will give you different answers, no matter how rigorous the quantitative technique. 
and even under ignorance, where we don't know what we don't know, again, this interaction, this explicit interaction between a plural and conditional interaction between qualitative attention to framings and quantitative assumption, attention to what that means for the magnitudes, um, you can use it under ignorance as well, where we look at civic research, surveillance, citizen science, where people go out and decide themselves what they're going to be monitoring. The questions that get asked can be quite different. It's not very sexy in science to do surveillance, but, um, and so it tends to get, or monitoring, it tends to get a bit neglected. Diversity, reversibility, flexibility are qualities that only come to the fore when we are humble enough to acknowledge our qualitative ignorance. So that's my picture, really. I think. I don't want to stick in this quantitative quality divide because I think it's not entirely helpful. It helps us get somewhere, but in the end, it's not about a logjam between the two. It's be about being more humble about where any kind of research can give and that the picture we should be looking at is more like the picture on the right, being explicit about how even the best available evidence actually delivers different answers under different interrogations. And the process of exploring that is actually fundamentally qualitative, but quantitative methods have an awful lot to add to be transparent and accountable and systematic about it, but the claim that quantitative methods are more fundamental or they're only valuable when they give one answer actually erodes that, and that's why I'm presenting this in the way I have. Thanks very much.